Thank you. Thank you, Sanji. Thank you, everyone. And Manohar Raju, it is just a great joy and honor for all of us to have you join us today in conversation. And I think that you will be, are equally honored to be able to join our global defenders who really together were in this. As you know already, International Bridges of Justice is focused on systematic early access to a lawyer for every single person um, at the earliest possible mandated time so that we can really project, protect. It's particularly exciting for me, I think, as, as, um, as you know, I started at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office and there really saw the blatant criminalization of race and poverty and then have gone on to see that actually this is, this is really a worldwide problem and very, very courageous defenders who are also on this call are very excited to both hear from you and also be in dialogue with you about how we as a worldwide community can move forward in this. So I think that many of you have already seen um, Manohar's wonderful bio. I'll just highlight that he leads the San Francisco Public Defender's Office he was appointed by the mayor of San Francisco to be the public defender after the tragic passing of legendary defender Jeff Adachi and subsequently elected. Manohar is the first South Asian elected public defender in the United States. He is also a founding member of Public Defenders for Racial Justice. A son of immigrants from India, his pursuit is rooted in his acute awareness of the ramifications of social inequities. Mr. Raju completed his undergraduate studies at Columbia University and holds a master's degree in South Asian studies from UC Berkeley, where he also earned his law degree. He worked as a public defender in Contra Costa County for seven years before being recruited by Jeff Adachi to join the San Francisco Public Defenders Felony Unit in 2008. Um, what it doesn't tell you in the bio is that Raju Manohar is one of our very celebrated um, superstar trainers and has been of support in particular, not only to International Bridges of Justice globally through the support he's given, but also to the India program. So back in 2008 in July, uh, Manohar helped lead our training, which was the first India national training for legal aid and then came back again in 2009 to do a training with Ajay Verma on early access to counsel in Pondicherry. So I just know that there are so many defenders who are excited to hear from you. And um, Ajay also said to me, he says about you, Manohar is a very committed and calm person and always ready to guide colleagues. He says, Manohar has been the key person whose work has inspired me to persuade, has inspired me to persuade and work closely with stakeholders of CJS during COVID times. So you, you've been an inspiration to many. We're very um, excited to hear you and then also to be in discussion with you. So without further ado, if you could maybe just give us some of your thoughts. Number one, tell us a little bit about yourself. What brought you, why, why are you committed? to early access to law protection. The second thing is that you have been quoted as saying, police violence on the streets is just one part of a system impacted by inequities at every point. So if you could maybe expand upon your thoughts and reflections um, in terms of the overall system that is broken and suggestions for how we can move forward. And lastly, Matt Gonzalez spoke of your success as a trial attorney in the press conference after the mayor appointed you to be the public defender. I think he said that you were the finest or the best <laughs> trial attorney he had seen. So can you also share with us how you managed to achieve success in what you believe to be an unfair system? So Manohar Raju, thank you. Thank you. And welcome. Thank you. I really feel blessed this morning to be um, uh, dialoguing with this international community here. Uh, thank you, Karen and Sanjeeva for um, inviting me here today. I have very fond memories of the trainings that we did in India, and I'm very um, just grateful to be here today. I also want to, on this day, 
uh, lift up the spirit mm -hmm. of George Floyd because and um, and his and his whole family. I have uh, in, in my mind forever is a a little clip that I saw video clip of on the shoulders of a pro former professional basketball player named Stephen Jackson. And what she said, was saying was, my daddy changed the world. Um, and I really feel that at this moment, uh, maybe we could show that um, uh, slide from Syria. At this moment, you know, there is such international attention. There are worldwide movements as we see with this muralist in Syria, um, this police violence has really captured the imagination. Uh, the opposition to state violence is really, uh, it's a worldwide movement right now. And I think this is a um, vital time to really capitalize on the, the possibilities that we have. Um, myself, I came to be a public defender and my vision is really rooted in uh, notions that the criminal, what I'm gonna call the criminal punishment system rather than the criminal justice system or the criminal legal system, I'm gonna call it the criminal punishment system because that's unfortunately what it is in, in the United States and, and too many places in the world, um, is rooted in an understanding of colonialism because the same impacts in many ways that slavery has had on the United States, uh, colonialism has had on India. And I've seen those, the impact of that on my own family and communities who come from a farming village in South India. And I think it's vital that we make those connections between international systems and the system in the United States where I practice. Um, there are many different areas that you can practice, I think, as a lawyer, if you're interested in social change. For me, though, the reason that I was drawn to public defender in particular had to do with my, the way that I feel and have felt in the courtroom itself. Um, the first time in law school that I did a moot court practice my uh, professor came up to me and he really liked the way that I did the cross-examination and the way I felt in closing argument. And uh, as soon as I began doing misdemeanor cases, uh, the way that I felt in the courtroom and the feeling that I got made me uh, yeah, yeah. That's it. intuitively that uh, I was doing the right thing. So let me begin. Uh, I think it's very auspicious that we are doing this talk today on June 19th because it's a, it's a celebration called Juneteenth in the United States and it's a celebration honoring the end of slavery in the United States and at a time when we are really looking at the need for structural change we can't analyze the criminal punishment system in the United States without going back to an understanding of slavery in this country and uh, subsequently the uh, institutions that have evolved from that, which includes the segregation era of Jim Crow and now includes the current uh, system that we have. There's a book written by Mich Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow, which some of you may be familiar with. And what she said was the common, the current criminal legal system is really a way extending, a way of extending what Jim Crow was doing legally in the United States, which was a legalized form of segregation in the United States. As a public defender, someone who vigorously defends the rights of accused, I often think of what we do in the form of a triangle. And if we could have that slide put up for the audience. 
that triangle, as a public defender, I feel that we are counselors, we are warriors, and we are activists. Being raised in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office by one of my mentors and heroes, Jeff Adachi, he always emphasized the need for the defense attorney to be an absolute warrior in the courtroom. Leave no stone unturned and not be afraid to go to battle uh, to really try to get the best results possible for our clients. And we're also counselors. And when I say counselor, I mean that that bond that we form with our clients is a sacred one. And our hope is that whatever the legal outcome of the case, that we facilitate our clients to be in a better place at the end of our representation than they were at the beginning of the representation. And through the representation, we serve our clients. So ultimately it's up to our clients to make the best decision for what to do with their case. But any individual's decision is going to be affected by their relationship with their counselor. So if you have a counselor who's inspiring confidence in you, if you, if you have a counselor who's also a warrior, who's doing every bit of investigation necessary in the case, if you have a counselor who's also a warrior, who's filing every single legal motion that's appropriate to be filed in the case, then that client is gonna have much more confidence and potentially uh, make be much better decisions in the case. And not only that, as Karen mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of our clients uh, suffer from structural racism, st structural inequities in the system. So we'd like to, at the end of our representation, see our clients hopefully um, be set up with employment, be set up with rehabilitation services if necessary, uh, be connected to a, a tech internship of some sort, um, bit, or uh, pursuing further educational opportunities. So we really like to facilitate our clients getting to a better place. And now at this moment, and we can probably see that in some of the slides from our recent uh, protests, Black Lives Matters protests, if we want to put those up now. We're also activists because the same type of police abuse that happens in the streets does happen at every single point in the criminal legal system. You know, I was asked today to speak about due process, um, which is the preservation of rights in the legal system. Same time though, we're not just interested in preserving rights, we're interested in preserving lives, right? We don't want people to just feel, oh, I had my rights protected, but now I'm just serving a very long sentence in, in jail or prison, which is affecting me and my family. Sometimes that may happen, but we're interested in fighting to win for our clients, to really get the best outcome possible. The system in the United States has been held up as a model internationally because of this perception that due process is well protected in the United States. However, the reality is even though due process is there in name, there are so many forces in criminal courthouses that prevent us from really achieving due process from our clients. And that's the reason we need to practice at such a high level. I'll just touch on some of the um, problems with the system. One, pretrial detention. Even though there is a presumption of innocence in our legal system, the practical reality is most judges, even when we're presumed innocent, and most prosecutors will ask for our clients to be held in jail until they get their day in court, until they get their trial. What that leads to is a situation where a lot of clients will plead guilty just to get out of jail. 
right? And then we're not able to really fully um, embrace people's due process uh, possibilities. Another common phenomenon is that the trials aren't always as fair for the defense as they are for the prosecution because there's more pressure to convict um, more former prosecutors that are judges. And we often feel that the rulings that the judges make are more biased to the prosecution. Also, we have a jury system in the United States where before you are convicted, a jury of 12 has to agree that you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. However, it's very difficult to get a fair cross section of the community. It is not uncommon at all in San Francisco to have a black client and to not have a single uh, black juror. juror. And lastly, there's something called, that is com a common phenomenon called a trial tax. And what I mean by a trial tax is that it's not uncommon for a prosecutor to say, listen, the offer in this case is three years or four years, but if you're found guilty, I may sentence you to 15 years, 18 years. So this notion of intimidating the client into pleading guilty is a common phenomenon. And then the last piece is something called overcharging. There's a, a variety of much power held by the prosecutor. So the prosecutor is able to not file a charge at all or file something called a misdemeanor, which is a lower level charge for which the maximum time is one year in a county jail, a local jail, or they can file a felony or some of you may be familiar. We have something in, in California, the state I practice in called the three strikes law. They can file something called a strike for the same conduct. And that is something that will often dictate what happens in the case, because it's not uncommon for the prosecutor to charge something very serious and then say, oh, I'll offer you something less if you plead guilty. So all of those factors make it difficult for us to fully um, realize the due process that the Constitution envisions our clients should have. However, that's why we really insist upon a high level representation in our offices. Um, Ajay is somewhere listening to this talk and he knows that we've talked about client-centered representation. And what that means is the most important person, the most important connection that we have to have is not to the judge, is not with the prosecutor, but it's with our client in our system. Even in a negotiation, the most important relationship is to have that full faith and trust with our clients. Because if we have that, then it doesn't matter what the prosecutor says, it doesn't matter what the judge says, because the defender and the client are on the same page and we know what result we want and we're gonna continue fighting until we get that result. But today I'm going to suggest that rather than calling us client, calling this client-centered representation, that we call it community-centered representation. And this is why. The reality is that every client that we represent is part of a broader community. They either have friends or children or parents or relatives or neighbors or a broader community. And it's very important that, in my opinion, we bring that community into the courtroom. Because when a judge or when a prosecutor or when a police officer harms an individual, they're really harming that entire family. When that police officer murdered George Floyd, he took away the father of a daughter. And it's important 
that we bring that to full light whenever we can. Similarly, in courtrooms, we should be letting judges know and prosecutors know that when they are making a certain offer, or when they're trying to sentence someone to a certain amount of time, they're really sentencing. If you're sentencing a father, for example, you're also sentencing the mother because you're telling the mother, now you have to be the sole provider for these children. You're the one who's responsible for getting the children to school. I'm taking away 50% of the household labor from your household and the income from that family. So the decision I'm making as a judge is having an impact, perhaps intergenerate multi, for multi-generations because of a decision that I'm making. And I think it's really important for us to bring that reality into courtrooms and to make people with power aware of that. I was speaking, I'm going to be speaking next week at a panel on wrongful convictions. And in preparation for that um, conference, I had a planning meeting two days ago. And there was a young man who had been wrongfully convicted of a murder that he didn't do. That came to light. And after spending 16 years in prison, he was finally released. And what he told me is, please tell your fellow defenders, don't t whisper to me, this is a good issue for appeal. Try to win my case right now. Right? We have a system in the United States about where if you get convicted, you can file what's called a notice of appeal and there, an appellate court can look at it. These take a long time though, can take years and years and years. And it's very difficult to get a conviction overturned. But what he was saying is that a lot of lawyers, in his opinion, will tell clients, you know, you have a really good appeal. And what he said is, listen, I want an attorney, I want a defender to come to me with confidence confidence that he's going to win the case. If we have to go to an appeal, we'll do that. But please have more confidence that you can actually win at the trial court level, right? At the initial level before being sentenced to a long prison term. And I think that one way that we do that, and one thing that we encourage in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office is that the very first meeting with our client, in addition to discussing the particular aspects of the case, it's vital that we talk to our clients about something else about who they are. Tell me about your favorite nephew or niece. Tell me about where you went to school. Tell me about the neighborhood that you grew up in. Tell me about your grandmother and why she means so much to you. Tell me the three things in your life you're proudest of. The impact of that is that you as a defender then start becoming much more connected to our, to our clients. And when we're later on advocating for that client in a courtroom or in some other venue, some other place, you're speaking with much more feeling you're arguing with more passion and you're arguing with more passion because you have a deeper connection with the person that you're representing. So that's something that we try to encourage and that's how we get from protecting rights to protecting lives. Because I've been told in my own work time and time again by jurors, that they could see how passionate I was about the client that I was representing. And I think in our system, legal system, I think the jurors will really feed off of the energy of the defender. And they're more likely to make a right decision if they know that you really are fighting for this client because you really believe in him or her or them, rather than just because it's your job and it's your obligation to defend this client. Um, I think in this moment, you know, we started to, in the, in the global health pandemic situation that we're in now, we 
been advocating for the release of our clients and the release from jails. And, you know, I first heard about this happening in Iran, actually, where in Iran they were releasing people from jails because they were aware of this global health pandemic and the possibility that if people are in settings without social distancing, jail settings, that it's more likely that people will get sick and that then when they're released, other people in the community will get sick. So I think now more than any other time, we can say that we're not just dealing with a criminal situation, we're dealing with a public health situation. And people with power have to be aware that when they put someone in jail, they're actually making not just the likelihood of that one individual getting sick, but the whole community getting sick, right? We have um, been saying for a long time that many uh, alleged crimes dealt with in the criminal system are actually public health issues. For example, drug possession or drug use. And there's been an increasing awareness that that is the case. However, now even alleged violent crimes should be looked at from a public health analysis. Because the reality is, unless this is a life sentence, the person is going to come out. And if they're going to come out, it's better that they come out before contracting a virus that could potentially um, infect many other people in the community. So we should be encouraging people with power like judges to not sentence whole communities to a public health pandemic. And that's why we have to release people. Now, one response that comes back is, well, if someone committed a violent act, then they should be uh, incarcerated. Now it's our job to fight really hard for people in courtrooms so that if it's not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that that act was committed, the person can go free. However, even if someone, there is evidence in our system would be beyond a reasonable doubt that someone committed a violent act, we have to step back and think more globally. You know, when we talk about being activist, it's important that we start broadening the conversation about what an effective criminal legal system should look like. There are studies that show that the factors that lead to violence are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and economic deprivation. Those four factors. What happens in jails, prisons, carceral settings? Shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and economic deprivation. The exact things that tend to lead to violence. So if we're interested in stopping violence, why are we putting people in the place that's most likely to generate and create violent behavior? So now there's a movement in many places towards something called restorative justice or transformative justice. And in that realm, there's more of a focus on what is the harm, either an individual harm caused by one person to another or a societal harm caused by structural inequality over years such as in the United States, um, inequity in school systems, poor school systems for certain neighborhoods, segregation, environmental racism, uh, housing inequality. Let's look at all of these harms. So going all the way back in the United States today, I'm gonna to say again, because it's Juneteenth. Looking at all those issues, looking at all of those harms, look at the needs of those harmed, 
and then come up with solutions to help people deal with harm. Having said that, in the current system we are in, it's still very important that we fight really hard for our clients, right? And breathe life into, in the United States, the due process clause, the rights that we have. Brian Stevenson, some of you may be familiar with, he wrote a book called Just Mercy, and it's been released into a movie, and it's something that's pretty available now. And I recommend that everyone uh, watch that movie or read that book. He's someone who represents people who are on what's called death row in the United States, which means they've been sentenced to death because of the crime. And he goes deep into their lives in order to try to save their lives from the death penalty. And sometimes to get them exonerated completely or freed from incarceration. He talks about the solution to the problem of our deeply flawed criminal punishment system in the United States. And when I say deeply flawed, this country has 2.3 million people behind bars and many more on what's called probation or parole. So there's still people who are under the control of the state apparatus, the state punishment apparatus. He talks about four uh, solutions and I'm gonna talk about applying those to the work that we do to try to keep people out of jail to begin with or to free people. One is proximity. Two is changing the narrative. Three is a willingness to be uncomfortable. And four is hopefulness because hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Now, when we talk about proximity, and this is connected to the notion I was talking about earlier about community-centered representation, there's a moment in that movie where Brian Stevenson goes to the family of a man who's been sentenced to the death penalty. And when he goes to that family's home, he gets such a different perception because he meets the extended family, he meets the neighbors, he meets the uncles. He has such a different relationship to the client and he happens to meet someone who knows that the client wasn't at the place that, they, that the prosecutor said he was when the murder was committed. He was actually somewhere else. It made him a much better attorney and it made him someone that his client now had full confidence in because what the client said was all of the other attorneys, they would just call my home. They never went, they never made that drive to visit my family. And that made a huge difference in the way he represented that client. And what I'll tell people in San Francisco, what they tend to do, the prosecutors historically, they've labeled a lot of our black and brown clients as gang members because they're spending time with other people in their neighborhoods. And what we've countered with is this isn't a gang member, this is someone who's navigating a difficult neighborhood where there's violence, but the people you're calling his fellow gang members are really his extended family, right? And, but in order to really convey that, it's really important for the defender to go to the home of our clients sit in the grandmother's home, look at family photographs, soak in who that client really is so that when you're in court presenting, we were able to present with that passion because there are studies that say that about 70% um, of your communication is your body language. 20% is the way you're saying things, what that's called paraverbal communication, the emotional intonation of your voice. And about seven or eight percent is the content of what you're saying. So for that reason, it's really important that we transform ourselves by being more connected to the community of our clients so that we are, when we're talking in court, we're communicating with that full passion. Secondly, 
changing the narrative. So in San Francisco, what this gang task force prosecution unit would say is that for our clients, carrying a gun is like a carpenter carrying a hammer. The carpenter needs the hammer in order to do his job. This alleged gang member needs the gun because he's waking up in the morning thinking, who can I get, uh, who can I shoot so that I can get respect and I can instill fear in the community. So I, in jury trials, have called community experts to say, no, that analysis is completely wrong. Most of the people, young people, young black men that he knows in San Francisco carry a gun, not because they want to harm someone, but they carry a gun because they're afraid. And they pray in the morning that they won't have to use that gun. And they pray when they come home in gratitude they didn't use that gun. So they're carrying that gun prayerfully. They're not carrying it because of any violent intention, but because of they know there's been gun violence in their community, they feel they need it for protection, but they're certainly not doing it because of any uh, murderous intent or intent to harm anyone else. But they have the same emotions of fear and because of the neighborhood that they live in, that's what we call a navigation strategy. So I've called experts in um, youth culture to talk about that in courtrooms. A willingness to be uncomfortable. Can we play that short video, Andrew? This is something that happened, I believe, yesterday in Canada. Does it have sound? Does it have sound? But for some reason, we can't get the sound in. You can read, read this for a little bit, and then I'll talk. Okay, we can we can stop it, and I can just tell you what happened. Mano, you you got a few minutes to wrap up, then we go to. Okay, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, okay, okay. Right. I'll just if you stop it. Okay, what happened in this case? This is Jagmeet Singh, who is the leader of the New Democratic Party party in Canada, South Asian brother, and he was challenging an MP in Canada because he was trying to put forward some sort of ordinance about the systemic racism in Canada, particularly by police. And he was talking about examples of that. And I'll ask um, Andrew to send it to all of you later so you can look at it. And there was one MP who not only voted against it, but like brushed it off as if this was such, this wasn't even something he was even considering. And Jagmeet Singh got angry and he challenged him and he called him a racist and he was accurate. He was booted out of the House of Commons for that comment. But what that shows me is that sometimes when you speak truth to power, and later on they apologized to him actually for, and when you speak, but when you speak truth to power, it can be uncomfortable. And the system may not like that, but that's something in this moment we have to be willing to do. And I think because of all of these protests on the street now, the climate has changed and we are even more able to call things out as we see them. And that's something that was inspirational that Jagmeet Singh did. And then the last point I'll make, Sanjeeva, is that we must remain hopeful. As that young man told me who said, don't talk to me about the appeal, talk to me about winning now. Hopelessness is the enemy of justice. And we've actually seen a lot of change 
I know there were a lot of chat questions about how do we stop police violence. There's a movement in the United States to actually defund the police and to put more of that money into education, into youth empowerment organizations, into uh, housing for homeless people, into uh, black empowerment organizations. And this is a time right now where we can have dramatic change. And I also think that judges and juries have to be more listening to us talk about all of the injustices in the system. And I think it's a great time to get better results. We started that organization, Public Defenders for Racial Justice, after the killings in 2015 of African Americans, Michael Brown being one of them that caused a lot of attention, not as much as George Floyd, but certainly national attention. And that's a time where we thought we could be more explicit about race issues in courtrooms. And that's why we started that organization to make sure that public defenders were really talking about societal inequities and race inequities in our society because they pervade every aspect of the court system. And if we're honest in talking about that, we're more likely to accomplish justice in the courtroom for our clients and their communities. So thank you so much and happy to discuss, uh, to take questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Manohar. And um, we'd like to listen to you more. Uh, we will listen to you more. And uh, we're very pleased you join us uh, at around 6.30 a.m. your time, you can dress up and Thank you very much for that. Uh, so we're going to go for a question and A um, from um, the, our audience today, joining from all the way from the West Coast to uh, Korea, Japan. So it's like time zones, a few, many time zones. Some, for some of you, it's very late. Um, so um, um, we, we know that number of you have, have sent questions. So we're going to, to try to accommodate as much as possible. Um, but First of all, I'd like to call upon a few people uh, who have submitted questions. Um, Win Nanda from Mandalay, Myanmar. Uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Okay, Nanda, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, okay. Renanda, you can ask the question now. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Renanda. Uh, so, yes, uh, senior lawyer from Myanmar. She's an advocate in Myanmar. Yes, working with IBJ. Uh, what I'd like to show uh, is that police uh, can be brutal against uh, Benuel Bell, uh, prepared, uh, both uh, physically and mentally. And in one mind case, in one on my case, uh, is that police, uh, in one on my case, a uh, uh, police charge a juvenile with a, a bad man in model. Uh, because uh, he was somewhere near the crisis. His parents were an educated and uh, couldn't produce uh, his birth certificate. All they could say was that he was born in, in 2003, uh, but uh, the police for his age as 19. So uh, we challenged uh, to bring it to bring uh, to a spot, uh, a spot to make necessary examination uh, to provide uh, his age. Thus, uh, the police delayed to submit the medical report and uh, demanding the mother uh, to be bright. This is not a male ongoing case. Uh, this is an ongoing fighting. So it's my question. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nanda, it's, it's a kind of a comment. Manohar, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a few of them to, to post their questions so you could finally respond. Uh, Jean-Claude uh, Barakam Fritier from Burundi, please. Jean-Claude, you can un unmute and speak. Can, can, I, can I say one thing in response to that comment, though? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Is that 
So in San Francisco, in California, where I practice, I think the issue was that the police or the authorities were calling a young person an adult. Even though this was a teenager, they were trying to prosecute him as an adult. And they were basically not listening to the evidence of the uh, birth certificate that you were providing. So one, that's why I think it's beautiful that we have organizations that's like International Bridges of Justice, because we need to amplify those injustices when they happen. I actually was the, per the one of the attorneys who tried the last case in San Francisco where they prosecuted a juvenile, a young person in adult court. We were successful in that case. And one of the reasons we were successful is because the jury understood some of the dynamics around being a young person in the United States. But also in San Francisco, we have led an effort to close the juvenile facility because there's increasing understanding that the young adult brain is still developing and is not fully developed until someone is 24, 25, or 26 years old. Well, so we're suitable for that youth in a very different manner than we treat adults. And we should be putting much more emphasis on rehabilitation, youth empowerment, education, rather than punishment. Yes, so Charlotte, uh, you, in your fight for your clients, and you know, I think that along with international bridges to justice, we have to bring political pressure on authorities to not act that way and perhaps international pressure. Thank you, Manohar. Um, so we're going to get a couple of more questions. Um, we get um, Jean-Claude uh, from Burundi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jean-Claude Barak uh, I am the country director of Burundi uh, International Bridge to Justice program uh, called uh, Burundi Bridge to Justice. I'm a criminal defense, uh, a def a defense lawyer in Burundi. Um, my question is uh, about uh, uh, police brutality. Um, I have met many clients uh, who have underwent, uh, uh, faced uh, abuse during police custody. Uh, we as lawyers have uh, uh, worked closely with the Burundi police to prevent um, such abuses. Uh, we think police can change as we have uh, witnessed in some cases. However, that may take uh, a long time. Uh, I would like to know how we, uh, we, uh, we can, as defense lawyers, uh, expedite uh, the positive changes among the police. Okay. I think that's an excellent question. And Unfortunately, too many times, the very training that police have is more of a military training instead of a de-escalation training, right? So what we are pushing for in the United States, there, when you have an emergency in the United States, there's a number that you call, it's 911 on the phone. And whenever you call 911, who comes? A police officer with a gun. With a military gun. So what we're saying is, listen, every call for help does not require a violent person trained in military tactics. What we should have is someone to do the assessment. Sometimes it's a mental health professional who should be coming. Sometimes it's someone trained in dispute resolution. Sometimes it's someone who do, knows how to perhaps uh, be a youth empowerment expert, right? Um, sometimes it's a public health practitioner, if it's maybe someone who's dealing with a drug uh, overdose situation. So that's one thing. I think we have to stop relying on the police for so much of that. Um, I do agree there's a possibility of change, but that has to be a dramatic cultural shift in police departments. In the United States, what, there's been some trainings on something called implicit bias because they found that the police were much more likely to shoot when they saw a young black male as opposed to seeing a white person. And they were quicker to look at something and think they needed to use to shoot in self-defense. 
However, I think there's got to be a really different culture and there have to be consequences. If we're going to have consequences for other people, there has to be consequences and accountability for police officers when they use that abuse. In the United States, we have a double standard. They very rarely prosecute police officers, even though we have that system. So we need to have the system where the police also get prosecuted for abuse if we're going to have this system of traditional prosecution. The police shouldn't be excused from that behavior. But until that time, unfortunately, the culture, I think, will lead to more of these abuses. But I think this moment right now, this international pressure, this international awareness of what happened to George Floyd is a deep moment for us really thinking collectively and internationally about how to transform violent police culture. So anyway, thank you. I commend you for your efforts and I'm looking forward to seeing how you're changing things in your country and perhaps we can learn from you. So thank you so much for your work. Right. Um, I, we have a question from Prasha from uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, Prasha, can you unmute and ask a question yeah. which is quite related to the earlier question? Hi. I'm Prasha, Prasha, yes, go ahead. I'm a defense lawyer from Sri Lanka. So Hi. just I want to ask a common questions like that. Um, many countries nearly in their systems, but none of the systems uh, held like they uh, accountable and penalized the police officers' actions. So just I want to know why is that? That's, you know, that's why when I said we have to go back into history, I think it's very important that we have to go back into history. Oftentimes the police are there to maintain a certain social order. So it's even though we have on the books, these notions of equality, these notions of fairness, these notions of due process, in reality, the people in power don't apply those the same to everyone. And it's really important in our case that we start to do that. I think the case of George Floyd is going to be an interesting case, the, the uh, police officer who murdered George Floyd. Because if any client of ours had done that, they'd be prosecuting them immediately with first degree murder, the top charge, and they'd be saying it's an easy case to prove. And already right now, I'm hearing the prosecutor saying this is going to be a difficult case to prove. They're making a lot of excuses already, which is, which is not fair. But I think as far as the reason, in the United States, the police department initially was actually there to enforce slavery in the U.S. And it's evolved from that time to what it currently is. So I think it's important that we go back to the origins of police departments and see how they were initially put into place and then push for equal accountability. It's going to be defenders like us who are able to do that. I actually think it would make a lot more sense for the defense community doing the prosecution in those cases, because we're the ones used to seeing the police abuse. And the prosecutors are the ones used to using police officers as their witness. And then those same prosecutors are the ones who are charged with um, trying to prosecute the police, but they generally tend to be similar minded. Um, so I think it's actually, if they're actually, we're actually gonna get justice, it should be people with our mindset, with defender mindsets who do the prosecution. And I think that's probably a direction that we need to go in internationally. Right, this uh, point I want to invite Ajay, a good friend of uh, Manohar too, and Ajay, go ahead with your question. Hi Ajay. Good to see you. Hi. Namaste, Manohar. Namaste. And first of all, Manohar, it is an honor to have you here. Exactly today, 19th June 2009, we both did a training at Pondicherry. Okay. And it is almost 11 years. And today I saw, I'm so honored to have you. My quick question is this, Manohar. Uh, how the prosecutors and the police in American system view the early access of counsel at the uh, police station level? Because in, a, in India, it is seen that the police normally think that if the early access is given, the police case will be demolished. 
or the accused will turn how in your experience how is this uh, is it securing justice or it's not well it's something that we actually pushed for in the san francisco public defender's office is an extra unit and more funding to make sure that as soon as people are arrested we are able to uh, meet with them and that's even before the first court hearing i think that in there are different systems and we're not able to see as many people as we'd like to because we don't have enough funding for that however i think that's crucially important um, as I said at the beginning, it's really important that we establish that bond with the client as early as possible. Being arrested and being in custody is a very traumatic experience. It's emotionally traumatic, it's physically traumatic, and we are the counselors for um, our clients. And that's why even at that first meeting, in addition to advising people of their rights, advising them to make sure they don't talk to the police because inevitably the police are trained to try to twist the words of our clients to try to secure a conviction so that in addition to ensuring our rights and giving our clients confidence that we get to establish that relationship with them so that we can continue to fight effectively for them throughout but i think it's vital um, and i know international bridges to justice and you in particular in india have been pushing for that early access to counsel, but again, it's not just enough to have access to counsel. We need access to excellent counsel, right? We need access to counsel that are really going to understand every single one of the rights that our clients have and fully hold uh, the powers that be accountable to honoring uh, those rights. Thank you, Manohar. Um, Joy Medivo from Kenya. Please go ahead with your question, on mute. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Manoha, for a very insightful um, talk today. It's been, it's been eye-opening for me and very inspiring. Now, quickly to my question, let me play the devil's advocate here. You said that the police in, in America have the enforcement of slavery as their background. In Kenya, we have the enforcement of colonialism as the background. Can we, as human rights defenders, have a role in ensuring that our police officers are all racialized so that they're able to offer policing that does not give rise to too much brutality. With the background of this is a high stress job, many of them work with less than stellar uh, circumstances with not enough pay. Do we have a right defending our main perpetrators, so to speak? Is there a role for human rights defenders to help the police to be able to better do their job so that they offend less, so that we have less work to do on the side of protecting victims? Yeah. That's my that's a that's a wonderful question and i think there is a role for them i think they should be inviting us to their meetings i mean i had one police officer in san francisco that i'm aware of who was willing to write a letter for a former client of mine saying yeah i know this i know him he's he's not a gang member like the other like other members of my police force are calling him and that took a lot of courage on his part and i think we may have play, be able to play some role in perhaps educating some officers. I think one uh, move should be that certain officers are patrolling without weapons, without guns. And that's not something that's happened yet in my city. And that is something, a direction we should be moving in. At the same time, if it's a police officer without a gun, then why don't we have some other people? Why don't we have some other organizations uh, community leaders who are doing some of the proling and minimizing conflicts instead of uh, police officers. But I think that we can have a role in increasing uh, police officer sensitivity to situations. But um, I think it's also important that we make moves to defund or move reallocate resources to other organizations that really empower um, our communities and prevent the need for police officers to begin with. Thank you. Um, Nadine from Kabul, Democratic Republic of Congo. 
Now, the, uh, you've sent your question in French. You can ask the question in French and, and then um, uh, we will try to translate it into English uh, quickly for Manohar and the audience. Nadine, you can unmute and speak. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je m'appelle Nadine Amundifeza. Je suis avocate de la défense en République démocratique du Congo et travaille avec IBG. Nadine, can you, can you ask your colleagues to mute? Okay, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Merci. Je disais, euh, je suis Nadine Amoulifeza. Je suis avocate de la défense en République démocratique du Congo et travaille avec IBJ dans son programme de la RDC. Et je voudrais demander euh, à notre formateur que peut faire un avocat qui propose à son client victime des abus de la police ou du service de la sécurité d'initier une plainte, mais son client refuse du fait qu'il qu craint pour sa sécurité quant aux représailles de ses bourreaux en armes euh, dans le contexte de notre pays, qui est la République démocratique du Congo, où la sécurité des personnes et de leurs biens demeure un mythe. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And for, for the English speakers, I mean, the, the, the summary of that is basically in the context of our country, Democratic Republic of Congo, security of people and their property remains a myth. What can a lawyer do if he has, he or she has a victim, uh, sorry, if she or he has a client who is a victim of police abuse, how to initiate a complaint if his or her client refuses because, refuses to call, to say something because he fears for his or her safety due to possible reprisals by the police? You know, this is a big problem that we also face in the United States. One of the big issues with uh, police abuse is that the people that we are supposed to complain to are the police. So it's very difficult to envision the police policing the police. Like in San Francisco, we have something called the Department of Police Accountability. We have a police commission. We have a police department and everyone who is supposed to be um, keeping our people, the community safe from the police has the name police in their name. So I think that the people who are best suited to police the police are the defenders. And I think it's really important that we start ourselves as defenders collecting all of this information and being able to show which police officers are the ones who are systemically abusing our clients so that we can remove those officers, back to Joy's point, not all of the police officers are doing that, but some are. And the ones who abuse our clients' property and person and safety need to not be police officers. They need to be removed from police forces. But that won't happen unless we have those records of those systematic um, abuses. So my encouragement and something we're trying to do in San Francisco and in California and the United States slowly is to have the defenders be the people who keep track of the police and keep those records so that we can, as defense organizations, um, bring that forward to other political officials to hopefully weed out the bad actors. Thank you, Manohar. And um, I want to invite uh, Joel Kabagambe from Rwanda. Joel, you can unmute and speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanji. Thank you. Mano, uh, I'm Joel Kabagambe. I uh, work with National Bridges to Justice. Uh, I'm a senior lawyer in Rwanda Bridges to Justice. My question is that 
uh, we know all of all of us know that uh, seeking justice in, is especially a challenge from immigrants and migrant worker in every country. So, what is the impact of racism on, on that minority group, especially for black immigrants in, in, in USA? And what can a defense lawyer can do so that he protects the rights of immigrants in such situation? Thank you. It's very important that we also protect the rights of immigrants. In our office, the public defender's office, we also have an immigration unit within the public defender's office to make sure that any criminal conviction is made, any, that the representation on the criminal case is made with the full knowledge of the immigration consequences. We're also fighting to release people from immigration detention in the United States because it's not safe, uh, not just, and in this moment, particularly with the global health pandemic, um, really not um, you know, something that could lead to greater outbreak for our communities. One thing that we do is try to amplify those conditions. And again, when I say humanize um, and proximity, it's really important that we tell the stories of our immigrant clients because there's so much racism against immigrants that and the way to, I think, bridge that gap and to minimize the impacts of that racism is to begin telling the stories. So in the United States, there's someone who released a video. And if you go to my social media, and I'll have Sanjeeva send you my social media accounts, because when I put something on social media, I'm doing it explicitly to help the movement, both nationally and internationally, to show the humanity of our clients. But in that video, he was able to show the close congestion of people and therefore expose the immigration authorities' mistreatment of our clients. And he was released shortly thereafter because they were embarrassed by what the conditions were in immigration detention in the United States. And now we've begun to file motions to release people from immigration detention. But I think one of the keys is to begin telling those stories. We've actually are entering into a relationship with a documentary film company to begin to show the conditions of, because to become an immigrant is such a courageous story and takes so much. And I think if more people knew how difficult it was to immigrate to a country, then we could change hearts and minds about the way our immigrant communities are treated. And we just recently had a decision from the Supreme Court just uh, yesterday, two days ago, which allowed the, which transformed the way that the children of undocumented immigrants are treated in the United States. So again, I'm after, even though we know there's a lot of racism against immigrants, I think we have to be hopeful that we can hopefully transform the culture. And in this moment, when there's so much more um, awareness of the Black Lives Matters movement, I think we have to make sure that the Immigrant Lives Matter movement is working hand in hand. And they're often, in, and many times it may be the same movement, but they're, we're sort of working on these struggles at the same time. You know, this is a good time to expose um, both of those issues right. and to continue to fight hand in hand. Thank you very much. Um, we appreciate everyone staying with us because we are a little over time, but we're yeah. going to ask, take one more question and then we're going to be closing the session. Uh, this is uh, from Judge Hussein Bakri from Syria. He'll be asking his question uh, in Arabic and then there'll be a quick translation. Uh, Judge Hussein Bakri. Uh, shukran jazilan manuhar. الحقيقة هذا البرنامج سوريا سعيدون جدا بهذا اللقاء من الرائع أن نستمع إلى خلاصة تجربة لخبير عبيل لسنوات في هذا المجال أحب أن نوه أن كما اللوحة التي عرضت في بداية هذا الاجتماع التي رسمت 
على منزل مدمر تعاطفا مع جورج فلويد كذلك محامون في سوريا يعبنون للدفاع عن المتهمين في أوضاع صعبة جدا من خبرتكم وتجربتكم كيف أدت جهود محامي الدفاع الجنائي ومنظمات حقوق الإنسان إلى تحسين الوضع بشكل عام عمليا هل استجابت السلطات للضغط من جماعات المجتمع المدني أم أن التغيير كان لا مفر منه بسبب الحركات المدنية شكرا جزيلا Thank you so much, uh, Manohar. We're very happy um, to meet you. And I want to refer to the mural that was presented uh, in the beginning of this meeting. Um, it was painted in Idlib in solidarity with George Floyd. I just want to say that our lawyers in Syria are doing the same in solidarity with their clients. Uh, they are doing everything in their power to try and alleviate the suffering uh, of the accused uh, in Syria. My question is, from your experience defending the rights of the accused, how did the efforts of defense lawyers and human rights organizations lead to the improvement of this situation? Uh, practically speaking, did authorities respond to lobbying from civil society groups, or was the change uh, inevitable because of the civic movement? Well, the changes are in process, but they're still um, they're still happening. I mean, the movement is continuing. Um, thank you so much for your question and for your work. I think that this is something that um, we have an opportunity as defenders now to follow the lead of communities, to follow the lead of this international movement. Um, I think there is so much more increasing awareness right now of the injustices of the system and not just the injustices on the street, but the injustices in the courthouse, right? And I think this is a moment for us to really follow the lead of community and start really pushing. Um, there are most of the time when there's been dramatic change, it's come because of a struggle of the community. And right now, I think that the community is making a lot of connections that weren't made in the past. And that's why right now this movement of defunding the police is growing in the United States. You haven't seen a moment where the mayor of a major city like just now in Los Angeles is claiming he's going to defund his police department by $150 million. Now we're gonna have to check to see exactly what's happening in that situation. Is he really decreasing the funding or is he just not increasing the funding? But nevertheless, the moment is now and politicians are beginning to change and are beginning to speak out against it. And these are politicians that wouldn't have said something like this even two months ago. So it is something led by the community. And I think it's really important for us as defenders to really listen to the community. And then since we're advocates and attorneys and have are in a potentially more empowering position to then go to halls of power and try to really affect change at this moment. Because as defenders, we're, we can really be the bridge between the communities commit, uh, that are impacted by police violence and those in power. And I think this is a moment where we really need to embrace that crucial role that we have and be that bridge to make substantive, substantial change. Um, but the changes haven't, hap haven't happened to the degree that we want to in the United States. And it's going to be a long, protracted struggle that takes weeks, months, and years. It's going to be an ongoing uh, movement for change. And we're very grateful to the community and this uh, brilliant outpouring of democracy that we've seen flowing into the streets, because I think that's what's going to lead to real hard decisions and potential uh, transformation. Thank you very much, Manohar, right. and, and thank you very much for all of you who joined us. Some of you very late time. I see Okwen Det in his office quite late in around 10 o'clock in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Um, and, um, and for the questions and, and the discussion um, um, this moment, also thank you interpreters uh, who interpreted in six tracks, six languages, this was carried on. 
and great. And I see some old staff members like Marlon Sakeo joining us from Johannesburg. Hi, Marlon. Um, so at this moment, I want to um, close um, by inviting uh, Karen to say a few words and then we'll be closing. Karen. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Manoha Raju, for your for your sharing with us. And I think um, thank you all the defenders. Thank you all the defenders who spoke and asked questions and made comments. I think that um, Manoha, you can see also that we talk about an international movement that these are really the defenders who are leading the international movement. Thank you all for continuously choosing hope. We know that this is, as defenders, it is not easy work. It is very difficult. And you are working with people who are voiceless and invisible and oppressed. And it would be very easy to throw up your hands and say, what can we do? And yet you are committed to the long haul moving forward with it. So I would say that for the defenders, as I was told by one defender once in Burundi, keep on keeping on. We talk about the fact that you, you are all making history. And we have said before that we sometimes make history case by case by case. People think, oh, what difference does this case make? And yet that case, and they all combine together, you are shifting and creating history. And at the same time, we realize that you're also making history, not only if, with your individual cases, but also what you're doing province by province, state by state, area by area, region by region, as you strategize, but also now country by country. And as all of you and all of us come together country by country, we will create a new global reset of criminal justice. So thank you for leading this moment and this movement and keep on keeping on. For those of you who are not defenders, I would ask you right now at this very critical time in history, do whatever you can to prioritize this on the global agenda. Because if we do not have the support and we do not have the finances, it's well-intentioned, but it will not move forward. So contact us at International Bridges of Justice and let us know how you can support us to prioritize this globally and make this a true reality where every single person has the protection of a lawyer at an early stage, a competent lawyer. Thank you all for your wonderful work. And thank you, Manohar Raju. You've been a fantastic first guest on our series. Thank you, Karen. It's really wonderful. I feel really blessed to be in the presence of so many beautiful defenders around the world. So really grateful for today. And thank you so much uh, uh, for your right. solidarity and for all of your work. Very great. Thank you very much. Everyone, um, have a good rest of the day. For some of you, have a good day and some good night. And we'll Hi. join you next time with another talk like this. And we'll all invite you. We'll hope you can join us. Have a good day. Good evening. I'm ringing the bell for justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank all you. of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thank you for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Lelika. Thank you, Lelika. Come on, come on. Hello.
I'm enjoying seeing everyone now because I can see more screens now. Thanks for all. Thank you. For all. As well as guidance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bishra. Hi, Marlon. Deborah. Thank you so much, Manoa. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Bacon Soleil. Thank you very much, Manoa. Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Manoa. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gypsy, Tata, Amir. Thank you, Akmal. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Amir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Missy, why don't you come in and see my friends from around the world? Oh. <laughs> my son's here playing soccer. I'm telling him to come inside and see you all. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Take care. Hi, Charles. Hi. Oh my How are you? What country are you in, Charles? Which country are you in? I'm in Mali now. I'm in Mali now. Yeah. But I work for UNDP. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I work also for IBJ. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very beautiful, much. beautiful. Thank you for everything you do. How we may contact you? Do you have any con social? Oh, you contact? can. Um, why don't you get in touch with Sanjeeva and he'll pass on your. And then we'll establish a connection. Manohar, maybe you want to even just write it on a piece of paper right now and hold it. Just, just quick, you know, even if it's quick, then let's see your social media Twitter. Oh. Or, or whatever. That is. Okay. Um, well, I think that's, well, I guess. Why don't we just, well, let's just pass it on afterwards. Or maybe Heather, can you put it up on the chat or something? Yes, I can. Will you tell it okay. to me one more time? It's uh, Mano Raju PD. Right. It will send to everyone. Yeah, exactly. We'll send to everyone our Facebook and our Twitter and all our addresses and um, also email addresses. And you can always get in touch with me through IDJ, through through Karen and Sajiva. Inshallah, we'll contact you. Okay. Okay, take care, everyone. Um, and let's, uh, Karen and Sanjeeva, let's set up a, and Andrew and everyone, let's set up a time to follow up and be brief. Thank you so much. And thank you, Andrew, for your help in setting up the visuals. Really appreciate that. No problem. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Take thank care. You, thank you. Have a wonderful Bye. day or night and weekend. Yeah, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Manohar. Take, take care. Take care, Amir. Thank you.